Hey, everyone. Um, so who am I? You just heard a little bit. I've, I'm the staff engineer at Intercom. I've worked here for about seven, seven and a half years. And for the last five, I've been on our data stores team. So data stores and Intercom own MySQL, Memcached, Elasticsearch, DynamoDB, but also things like our core Rails platform and uh, various parts of like our application stack, too. Um, uh, what am I here to talk to you about? Uh, stories about outages are fun. That's kind of where we started with uh, thinking about this. I'm going to try and put you in the shoes of like an on-call engineer responding to this incident. At Intercom, we use a volunteer-led on-call system, so any engineer could be on-call for the entire company. Uh, outages are also a great learning opportunity, so it's uh, a chance to like really reflect on things. Um, we're going to like try and relive the early stages of the outage. So we're, we'll go through it in a kind of timeline order. And it might seem pretty chaotic, and that's because it was. Uh, I'm actually editing down a lot of stuff that happened. That, like, there was a lot of people involved, a lot of parallel tracks. If you want a full story, you can come find me later. But there's way too much to get into right now. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about, after we hear what happened, like what mistakes led to it, like how did we get into a situation like this. And finally, we'll talk about changes we made to our application and our processes to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. So without any further ado, it's time to take a step back to the morning of February 22nd. It's just after 8 AM. You're on call, and you've just been paged because of elevated exceptions. Uh, you crack open Datadog, and you see this graph showing like ELB errors. This is like 500 responses. And they're up kind of from all web-facing fleets. But uh, the numbers look quite low, like 1.5K. That's uh, not the biggest uh, volume ever. Only a small percentage of requests are failing. Uh, and you see these exceptions saying like active model range error. Uh, you go and open up Sentry. And you see, you see an exception like this. So uh, if we zoom in a little bit, uh, we see a 2.14 billion. That sounds pretty familiar. The integer is limited to four bytes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, not great situation. Uh, what do we know? Uh, so after some time digging into it, you realize that well, we're failing to persist conversation part records because something is bigger than a 32-bit integer. Um, if we went back, you'd see that like, the, the name of the field is actually included in the exception, which uh, made things a little harder to debug. I'm not going to go into a full breakdown of Intercom's data modeling. Uh, we have over 800 models. <laughs> but uh, what, we, what I can tell you is that conversation part is like the model in Intercom, one record for every individual message exchange in a conversation. Um, I've just realized I've kind of left out what Intercom is. If you're not familiar with our service, it's a customer communication platform. So you can, our customers use Intercom to talk to their customers. Uh, like we can serve the application. Like the, the number of requests was, uh, number of failing requests was low, but nobody could actually start new conversations. So effectively, our product was totally down. Uh, and unfortunately for us, there are over 35 billion rows in the conversations part table. So just kicking off a migration is going to take a while. At this point, we don't really have anything better to do. So we just start that migration. It's going to take at least days. Uh, but hopefully, that's, uh, hopefully we can come up with something better, because that's not a workable solution. Uh, so what are we going to do? Like, what do we think? The, the migration is running. We know when it eventually finishes, it should fix our problems. Uh, but you also need to spend time working with other teams, getting people up to speed, trying to find an alternative solution. At this point, you've probably paged in, I think we had about 10 or 15 people at this stage. Uh, we have to pull in customer support to proactively work with them. None of our customers are able to write in and tell us they're having a problem because they also use Intercom. <laughs> But uh, they, like, we had to make, make it clear that there was something going, up, uh, going on. Uh, we also have to pull in marketing to start preparing for the idea that like, people are going to notice eventually. And, and this, this could be a big issue, like lots of posts on social media. Uh, we want to have a consistent response. Uh, we have a program manager involved at this stage. 
Uh, she's going to handle communications between the different groups of people responding, and also like bubbling this up to our exec team because this is like this is a, a serious outage, and uh, we have to start pulling in more and more engineers. So at this point, we're like relevant teams in different parts of the company are uh, kind of coming online. Our workday tends to start around 9 a.m., so we were pretty lucky that we, the page was quite close to the beginning of the day. Uh, we need to start brainstorming on what we're going to do. Uh, so at this point, it's about 9.35 and 75 minutes have passed from the time you were paged. Uh, and we have, we have some ideas. Uh, one of our principal engineers joins the call, and uh, he points out that Rails primary keys are signed by default. Uh, maybe you can see where this is going. Uh, we have a four-byte integer, but we've actually only used 31 bits out of the 32 bits. Uh, so we spiked out, like, what if we just overrode the, the field, unpack the integer, and then like, pack it back in as a, as a negative value? Uh, kind of gross. Um, we're pretty confident it would solve the problem. We're not so confident that something else wouldn't break. And cleaning it up afterwards would, would suck. Uh, as a side note, I, I don't really understand why Rails primary keys are signed by default. If, if anyone has any ideas, I would love to hear them. Uh, but we do like, have another idea. Someone else has suggested something. Uh, we can work around it by using some other relationships. So like I mentioned, we have over 800 models in Intercom. Our data modeling isn't necessarily in like fifth normal form, if you've ever read any books about SQL. Uh, so we have this idea that, like, OK, we can look up um, we can look up the value from another table, like we can load the conversation and then get the value we want from there. Uh, and we can just monkey patch that over the accessors for the attribute that's failing on, on the active record model. Uh, this is also kind of gross, but uh, in, you could, I guess, frame it in a way where you think that maybe this is getting better, like we're removing a denormalized field. Uh, and we can't really come up with a reason why this would break. Finding the nil values afterwards if we want to clean up kind of simple, so we just go ahead and ship it. Uh, and we can see this, this graph of exceptions tailing off. But at this point, like, why did it not go to zero when we fixed it? A uh, little, little concerning. So like, what now? It's been 150 minutes on the call. There's a lot of people involved. We thought we had a solution, and actually, we're still down. Uh, Turns out other models were also broken. Conversation part is very core, so a lot of the impact is mitigated, but actually there was a long tail of other things. So these things are kind of less critical, like customers could talk to us now, like we, Intercom was effectively back. But uh, the same fix doesn't necessarily work for all of them. So we have to start thinking about, like, what are we going to do? We, we can run these migrations. Some of the tables were small. Some of the tables were not so small. The biggest one, I think, only had a few hundred million rows, which is still big, but not, not compared to some of the, the large tables. Uh, but actually, the largest one in question also had no viable workaround, like no way of uh, doing the same trick of traversing the relationship some other way. So we have to start thinking, like, what do we do at this point? Uh, the impact is, is basically mitigated. Uh, but for the customers that are using the, the feature powered by that one model, like everything is still down for them. It's kind of not part of a core flow. I don't want to get into too much like granular detail about what Intercom is. Definitely customers that use this were not happy it wasn't working, but they were much less happy that they weren't able to have conversations. Uh, so we made the call that like, what if we just brown out that feature entirely? We use feature flags in Intercom, so we'll just like feature flag turning it off completely. Uh, and that, that's fine. It gets us back into. Uh, gets us back into a viable state. We have like 90 minutes to wait for the migration to finish, so turning off a feature for 90 minutes is, is kind of OK. Uh, so we're nearly there. You've been on the call for five hours at this point. Uh, it's a long incident call. I don't know if you've ever done a five-hour incident call, but uh, not, not the most fun. Uh, the, the migration is finished, and we think, like, great. Time to turn off that feature flag. Instantly, exceptions are back. We're down again. People are uh, panicking, and they just quickly turn off the feature flag. So, like, what happened? Like, how, how did we? Uh, why did the fix that we were certain would work not work? Uh, 
We use Ghost. I'm not sure if, you, if you've used it before, but it's a tool for doing online schema migrations on MySQL. It doesn't use the like, normal Rails uh, rake tasks for running migrations. Uh, the schema is fixed, though. Like, we, the migration has worked. Um, we're still seeing the exceptions. Uh, uh, but the problem was that we hadn't had a deployment. So Intercom at peak runs something like 50,000 Rails processes serving requests. Uh, so since there had been no deployment, none of those processes had been restarted, and they had, ca they had cached the schema. So even though the database underneath was working, the process would still fail. Uh, that's a nice, like, clear explanation. Fortunately, we managed to get there pretty fast. Uh, we just triggered a redeploy, and we think, done. OK, we're back up. Everything's working again. Happy. But like, is that, is that the end? Do incidents end when you get, when you get the uh, request to succeed again? Like, in some ways, I think incidents kind of only start at that point. Uh, this, this next phase took weeks, whereas earlier it had only taken day or hours, sorry. So in some way, the real work is only just beginning. Now you've mitigated the problem. To really like, get something out of an incident, you kind of need to learn from it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, as a, one of my colleagues would say, you have to understand the socio-technical factors that led to the outage. Uh, so how did it happen? Uh, this isn't the first time we've like, tipped over into a big int. Uh, I think our largest table has about 80 billion rows. And then the table I mentioned earlier had about 35 billion. So obviously, we had to do this before. Uh, and when that happened, you know, that was a, that was a, le uh, sorry, a red letter day for Intercom. We pulled together a team, got a principal engineer, a working group, we figured out what to do. We got all of our kind of top minds on making sure that this is going to work right. Uh, so we looked at all the dependencies. We made a plan. We made sure we were aligned, got in people from all the different parts of the product, and it all went perfectly. Like we thought of lots of things that could go wrong, things like this issue. Uh, and we handled them, and we didn't like systematize the learning because even though we knew we'd kind of have to do it again in the future, like I think this first happened maybe six years into Intercom, uh, and it was uh, like I said, it was a big deal, but hard to figure out what parts of it were going to be repeatable. And eventually, it happened again. A lot of the same people were involved. We did it right again. Nothing went wrong. So we're kind of a victim of our own success. It's really hard to learn from problems you don't have and easy to forget everything that went into making sure you avoided them. Ugh. Having a big, nasty outage as a, as a result sucks, but like, that does actually bring things into focus. And now you know you're going to do the work to ensure that you don't have a repeat. So like I said, we just keep do kept doing this. And eventually, someone said, like, hey, like, if a table is about to run out of primary keys, you know, maybe we should make an alarm that says uh, you need to run the migration. And every alarm in Intercom has a run book so that one of our volunteer on-call people can just respond to it and figure out what to do. Uh, so do you want to see the run book we wrote? Uh, like, what did the run book actually say? This is it. Primary key for table is approaching the maximum integer value. Migrate it to big int. And here's the dashboard. That's it. Nothing else. No, no mention of like, all the dependencies, all the things that might go wrong, all the things you need to know. Uh, so in 2023, that alarm goes off, and it says, like, hey, this table message threads needs a migration. And then the engineer just says, oh, OK, I see an alarm. I see a run book. It does, tells me to do this thing. And like, yeah, I've moved on with my life. I know that I've like, saved the day, fixed the problem. Uh, and the alarm is triggered when it's at 85% of the limit. So it took months to actually get to 100% at that point. Uh, so what has happened? Like Fundamentally, we missed foreign keys. Uh, right. Well, <laughs> um, OK, sorry. So uh, the problem was that we missed foreign keys, and we needed to uh, make sure that like, that doesn't happen again. So like, how, how could we have detected that in CI? Uh, 
earlier on, like when we had done it the first time, when that, when that team had been like solving this problem for the first time, they put some code like this into our kind of our spec setup, where we just run a, a quick migration, bump up the auto increment count on this comments table to be above the max integer. The idea being that any spec then that requires uh, a comment ID on another model will fail if it doesn't fit. Uh, the problem with doing it this way is that like this is just one piece of code buried deep in some R spec setup. Uh, you have to remember every time to go and like update it. Uh, it doesn't really mention what it's for. Like there's no comment explaining it. If you were lucky enough to be one of the people that knew why it was important, then like great, good for you. But that's not a very good pattern. Like you could say a solution that relies on someone remembering to do it every time isn't really a solution. That's just a like a band aid for the problem. So. We had to figure out, like, is there a better way to do it? I'm going to put a lot of code on the screen now. Uh, we monkey patched over the create table method of migration that like checks if we're in a development or a test environment, and then we hash the table name into a, a large value, and then and if it's a into if it's a big int, we like put it up like o over a trillion. That way, we always know in specs when they're running that like they're going to have a, a unique per table and very large primary key value. So this way, like CI will reliably fail if any model tries to put one of those big int IDs into a field that's too small. Another side benefit of doing this uh, is, the, is this idea that like every table now is unique. So one thing that we'd happened before or had happened before is that. Uh, we have a lot of similarly named models in Intercom, which is a bit unfortunate. We have like conversation, conversation part, message, message thread. Uh, so we've had people accidentally use like the wrong ID when they're looking something up. Uh, so you might say like uh, conversation dot find, but you'd pass in a conversation part ID, and that's an easy mistake to make. And in tests, that would often work because they all started at one, like they all they all started from the beginning. So doing this means that everything is unique now, and actually those things will also fail. So we removed like a category of flaky specs, maybe not the biggest category, but like one that did bite us occasionally. Uh, and we also like had that bad error message earlier, so uh, we went ahead and, and, and monkey patched over in active model uh, value for database. So value for database is the point at which that exception gets raised. And we just like include the name in the message so that we, you can like quickly go from like that sentry output I showed earlier. So when we uh, think back to that like output, we saw this. It just says like 2.14 billion is out of range for active model type integer with limit four bytes. Uh, it doesn't say what the field was. So including this, it would now say like uh, 2.14 billion is out of range for active model type integer with limit four bytes for field message thread ID. Uh, so we, uh, like I said, monkey patched over that. Uh, it, would have, it wouldn't have saved the day. It wouldn't have been the biggest deal, but it might have shaved 10, 15 minutes off of figuring out what the problem was, getting the right people involved. And there's enough to do during an incident without having like a fun little puzzle to solve like what, what field is, uh, is, the, is the issue. Uh, it also actually makes the, the problems from CI with the other patch I showed easier to debug because now you see what the, what the issue is right away. Um, I want to give a quick shout out actually. Uh, when this talk got announced on the, Rails, uh, on the Rails World Twitter account, someone responded like, oh, hey, you know, there's this thing, Active Record Doctor, that uh, it would have just solved this problem for you. Um, feels like it deserves a mention. Here's the link. Uh, it has lots of cool tools in it for checking your database schema and making sure it's in a good state. It actually uh, has a check for this for like mismatched foreign key types. Unfortunately, it uh, depends on referential integrity constraints, which we don't use in Intercom. And also, actually, the way our database is set up uh, with like lots of different clusters didn't play super nicely with it either. So it wouldn't have saved us, but maybe it would work for you. Uh, it has lots of good stuff in it. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the end. That brings us to the end of that, that incident. It's uh, like an interesting example, I think, of how you need to um, really think about what you're writing down. Like when you, when you have a problem, when you have an outage like that, you want to systematize your learnings. If you write a run book like that one I showed you earlier, and it doesn't include context you need to know, you've just made a worse outage for yourself later. Uh, so yeah, make sure that like, when you're learning from those kind of events that you 
are very deliberate about the actions you take. Uh, okay, thanks very much.